This week were four, five, and six. And they were all linked together um, by the time scale and by the, the focus, particularly four and five. In terms of what um, this, you were asked to do, was basically read and then make a few notes. Just going over a few things. The articles build up together. So if you don't read them, you're going to be so lost in this course, you'll, you'll want to run away and change your discipline altogether. So you must read them. Now if you just read them, and then move on to the next one, read it, move on to the next, we remember about 30% of what we read. That's all. If you take notes, it goes up to about 60, 60 to 70%. And if you record them, it's 100% because you've got the record all the time. So if you just skim through the articles, put them aside, you'll soon forget the detail. And you need the detail of the fourth article to understand the fifth, and the fifth to understand the sixth, and the third to understand the sixth, because they dovetail into each other. Now it's up to you how you do it, but you're going to find the, the weekly test very difficult if you haven't taken notes when you've read the articles. I know some of you do that, and I can see some of you put your hands up. And so last week, I was given three different summaries by two people, by three people, one each. So it's it's up to you. If you don't do the summaries, you're probably going to get a pass grade at best. If you do summaries, you're getting yourself a chance of getting a good B grade or an A grade, depending on how well you write in your project. And if you don't do the summaries of these articles when you do your project, your summary for your project is going to be terrible because you won't have learned anything about writing summaries. So these are your way of getting into this, the game. You don't have to memorize. That's the whole point. If you're reading, you're trying to memorize what's in it. If you take notes, you're not trying to memorize anymore. So it's actually easier to write a summary that you can look at later. And when you're doing your project, if you haven't done that, you'll really regret it. Because you won't be able to refer back to any of these articles when almost all of them should be mentioned in your project, or at least quite a lot of them. And you won't know which ones to use or, or why to use them. So do do that. And I apologize to those of you that didn't put your hand up but did write your summaries. Um, for those of you that didn't do any summaries, um, it's not a wise place to be. Now, the, the focus of this course is very different from anything else you've done. It's intended for your future more than your present. When you leave here, you'll be going in to become accountants. And I talked last week about the skills you need, and the main one being communication. And in order to communicate, you need to be able to critically analyse and critically think. And you need that from the start of your training as a chartered accountant and you will have to develop it further as you get towards qualifying and you'll find that the chartered accountancy exams are incredibly difficult if you don't know how to take notes and you don't know how to organize your thinking in a, in a critically sensible logical way you can get through university most of it without doing that but not when you leave so this course is trying to bridge that gap the other thing that you have to have in your toolkit is the ability to change jobs because each of you on average is going to change career at least seven times you think you're going to start as an accountant but by the time you're 80 years old you'll be in your seventh or your eighth or your ninth job each of them in a different line of work so you're going to have to learn how to be flexible learners to learn from what people say to you to learn by reading to learn by watching to learn by doing and the people helping you won't be trying to help you. They'll just be saying, get on with it, do it. So I'm trying this course to help you develop the skills of being a flexible learner. That's why this, that's one of the reasons there's no PowerPoints. It's to teach you how to learn without PowerPoints. Because in university, they are everyone's go-to. And to be honest, in my experience, over the last 25 years that we've been using PowerPoint, 26, because they came in about 1996. Um, students have gone from just 
putting them away somewhere to memorizing them and not taking any other notes. And that won't help you when you go to train as an accountant or in your later life. So we're trying to prepare you to take things in differently, to be inquisitive, to seek out your own knowledge and to try and develop yourselves as thinkers. So that's what this is all about. And the core of it is accounting history, but it could be Greek. This could be um, on any subject. But we're hanging the coattails on the accounting history course because most of you are interested in accounting one way or the other or in history. It's one or the other. Um, now, accounting history uh, has a very long pedigree. It goes back to Mesopotamia, 3000 BC, BCE. Uh, the first writers were people that kept records, which effectively is what accountants do. And they wrote on clay tablets. You'll see all sorts of different things, pebbles with scores in them, used for counting, taking inventory. You'll see all sorts of different examples of accounting, but the type that we are interested in today, and the history of it today, dates back to medieval Italy because that's where all modern accounting came from. And it came from that part of the world by a, a sequence of, of strange events, if you like. If you go back to 600 AD, 600 in this part of the world, time of life, 1600 years ago, and you went down to Italy, to your right, in other words, to the west, you get you can see, maybe you can see Spain and, and France and that. Um, Sp Spain and Portugal were occupied by the Moors uh, from North Africa, in other words, the Muslims from North Africa right across to Syria, right into the Middle East. And they had moved up into Europe and they were occupying up until the, the they didn't quite occupy the, the northwest of the peninsula, but they occupied all of Spain and Portugal apart from that and they were trading there. They also occupied Italy. They occupied a lot of mainland Europe. They didn't occupy the Brit Great Britain. But the Frankish Empire, for example, was, was full of... The Muslims were in charge of the whole of that area. And they had extensive trading right across their region. They got goods from China and they exported them all the way up to uh, France. And they took goods back into their regions and back across to China, and they were doing barter trades all the time. They had, um, along the, the paths they trod, there were little villages where they would have a representative who acted as a, the sort of go-between. And they maybe go there, leave all their goods, and then someone else would come pick the goods up and take them further on. So it was quite an extensive trade route that was taking place, but it was mainly centered round about where we would consider um, Iraq and round about the Middle East, across North Africa. In the uh, ninth century, there was a very strong, what we would call a king, but a caliphate from that region that was dominating all of that region, all of the, that world that I've just described. And then in the 10th century, it was replaced by another one from round about Tunis, Tunisia, that, that moved east, occupied Cairo, and led the whole of that business from there. When the Crusades started at the end of the 12th century, people from Europe started, soldiers from Europe started to go south. And one thing they did automatically, because they were coming in boats, was they cut off the Mediterranean. So the, the Moors could no longer, the Muslims could no longer uh, move north. The trade route was cut off. And over a period of time, they lost all control they had in the north. But you'll see, still see, for example, I think it's in the, in the short article about the Battle of Monteperti. It mentions a town where it was a Muslim town in the middle of Italy. That's all sort of changed. That all sort of died out. And the Italians took over the trade routes because it was Italian ships that took the Crusaders to uh, North Africa and the Middle East and into, the, where the, into Byzantium, where the Turkish Empire was, um, around Constantinople or Istanbul. And it was just that circumstance that led to the Italians being the dominant trading power 
of Europe from the 12th century till the 16th, at least. And because they'd had these people occupying the territory for all that time, there's a num number of centuries, all skilled businessmen and women, no men, they learned a lot of the techniques from them, and they learned what was needed and what wasn't. So, for example, if you read what the Maghrabi traders of the, of the 11th, 10th and 11th century were doing, that's the ones from um, North Africa, what they were actually doing, they were doing all the things the Italian traders were doing in the 12th and 13th century. Like they had bills of exchange, they used checks, bank checks, literally. Um, they used, uh, they kept accounts. We don't know what they look like because they haven't survived, or at least not enough of them have survived to know for sure. But they did keep records, and they had laws about um, currency, because currency was, uh, coins were, were scarce then, just as they were in medieval times, so, or sorry, in the Italian period. So they had to find ways around it, they had to prevent fraud from coins and all the rest of it. So if someone, for example, sent money across North Africa from one place to another, where it was received, it would come as a piece of paper. It was the equivalent of a promissory note, or what later became a bill of exchange. When it arrived, the person who went to collect the money from the person who had received the letter had to be paid in the same currency that the letter had been written in, which was the one where it came from. So the coinage moved around, and you could find coins from a totally different place in a, in a different place because you had, to pay, you had to pay out this money. So it was a little bit more inflexible than the Italian system. The Italians changed that and started to uh, they focus their equivalent instruments on the currency of the place the payment was going to take place. So that enabled trade to expand much more quickly than it had under the Muslims. So anyway, the Italians got their leadership position by accident. It was just a, a, it was just a coincidence that they ended up leading it. But once they did, they were coming out of a period when they'd been controlled by the uh, Holy Roman Emperor. The Holy Roman Emperor was basically the emperor of all of most of Europe. And in about the ninth century, he started to free up the Italian towns. And he gave them the right to rule themselves and to rule their states around them. So, for example, Florence was given its freedom. Its merchants were allowed to form guilds. And they were allowed to um, be politically, contr control politically the surrounding region. So they were getting their freedom. They'd learned all the basics of trade. And they started to put them into practice. And they emulated what the... Uh, Maghrabi traders had been doing before them from North Africa by traveling. So the Italians began to travel. No one else in Europe traveled like they did. They went as far north as they could, as far east as they could, and they just traded. And it worked out quite cleverly geographically because Venice on the east traded with the east. And Florence and Genoa and all the, all the other places on the, on the west traveled with the north, traded with the north. So you got the exotic goods being brought in through Venice, and you got the Europe, northern European goods brought down south by people from Florence and Milan and Pisa and all these other places that you'd never heard of till you read them in the article. So they, that's the way the system worked, and it worked really well. There was some battles between the, the Florentines, the Pisans, the Genoese, and the Venetians for the supremacy of the sea. And Genoa and Venice, for quite a time, had an ongoing battle over that. It lasted several decades. And Venice won in the end. And then everything stabilized, and it was just as I described. So Venice took control of most of the trade with the east, and the rest of Italy took control of most of the trade with the north. But there were still some from the west of Italy that traded in the east, and some Venetians went to Europe. Now, the way that the trade operated in the first part of, the, of that period, the 12th, 13th, 14th century, um, was through the major fairs in Europe. So you had the, and the main one was the Champagne Fair. There was another fair that went on just as much, quite close to it, Flanders. 
And if, it's in one of the videos that I recorded for you. I showed a map of the period, and you can see Flanders at the top with Ghent and Bruges in it. And then you saw where the county of Champagne was, and they're quite close to each other, but they were the two main European trading centres, but Champagne was by far the bigger. And from there, all the goods from the north were brought to the Champagne fairs and the Flanders fairs. And the merchants from the south went up and they took them. And in exchange, they brought all the goods that they got from overseas, from the east. So the spices and the silks. And you saw the sequence that happened at the Champagne Fairs in the second article, in the article six. And that was the way that trade worked. And it was refined, refined and refined. Now, in terms of the, the who was running the show, what you'll have learned in the sixth article, and it was covered slightly in article three last week, but in the sixth article, you told all about how the CME's bankers ran the Champagne Fair clearing system, how they uh, basically were in charge, and they were in charge of papal funds as well. They were the people with the most money and they needed a really good system of accounting. And luckily for them, in about 1160, no later than that, the bankers of the fairs in Italy had started to develop a system of bookkeeping that gave them control over their debt. So if people owed them money, they had records that the, the courts of the day would accept or would accept that they could read from them and then identify the, the evidence they needed to prove the entries were correct. So they started to do that, and you got the example from Bologna, where there was definitely double entry being used in 1211. And what the CNEs did, as did all the Italian fair bankers, as far as we're aware, they started to use the same system because it gave them the protection. And the laws that were passed by the communes, that's the towns, and the guilds, described the, the practices they had and gave them legal backing. And for example, there's a statute that says that for your account books to be recognized in law, they must, be, they must have the following information. <laughs> and it's all the stuff you'd put into a double entry journal entry. So they basically described what you had to do. And merchants at that time, in many towns, had to take their books to the guild headquarters and get them authenticated by a guild official. And they'd witness the type of handwriting that was going to be used in it, so that if someone came in with the book and said, look, they could say, well, actually, that's not your book because you didn't write it, because we know that that's not your handwriting. And it was quite a complex system, but they had it. And when they went up to Champagne, the CNEs, they took that with them. And they ran the clearing. They were the money changers in Champagne. They took over from the French. And that developed into banking. And that developed into the clearing system. And if you haven't heard about it, even in our banks, until very recently, there was a manual clearing system overnight, where all the banks would get together and they'd tell each other how much they had and how much each of them owed, and they'd work it out, and they'd pass money about. Nowadays, it's virtually 100% computerized, but it wasn't until very, very recently. And that's effectively what they did at Champagne, the bankers. And the only way they could do this clearing system where if X, if, if you owe you, and that's two people on opposite sides of the room for the benefit of those that can't see, um, if, you owe each other, if you owe money to you, and you owe money to you, then the money will be moved around so you'll end up paying you. So you, you, you. Save for that way. And that's the, the, what they did. They moved everything around as much as they could. Then when it got to, um, when Champagne and all that, the fairs, when they started to dwindle, get less popular, which was definitely by the 1320s, um, things changed to the, where the centres of trade were instead of to artificial places in the middle of nowhere. And the main centre of trade was Venice. 
Now, Venice isn't covered in that article, but it's covered in one that you'll uh, see either the next week or the week after. And it was very, very different. It had daily clearing. It wasn't clearing at the end of the trade of the fair. It was clearing at the end of each day. So it was very light now. So the bankers would just clear everything off and move on. And it was a permanent place, obviously. The trade, the goods came in from the, from the east and the Germans brought goods from Europe down to Venice and took the goods from Venice up to Europe. That's the way it worked. And so you had a great big German commune that lived in Venice that were basically the trade. Um, they were the pack mules of Europe. They took the trade, they took the stuff everywhere. But they also traded as well. They were big in soap, manufacturing of soap. Um, so they weren't just the people that did the transport. They were also active. And all of these um, traders that I'm talking about were international traders. Now that's the key thing. Accounting, as we know it, bookkeeping, double entry, was used by international merchants. And it was first used by international merchant bankers, like, for example, the Florentines at the fairs of Bologna. Because in those days, being international was being in a different town. So if you were, at that period, if you were in Aberdeen, you would consider yourself to have been doing an international trip if you went to Dundee. And that was it. So when we say international wholesale merchant from the Middle East, from the Middle Ages, we're talking about someone who traveled outside their town, basically. But these were international traders who traveled a long distance, if they were Italian, taking the goods to the foreign markets and bringing back the goods from them. And they were very, very wealthy, the Italian ones. Uh, made an awful lot of money. So they had to keep good accounts, and that's where this all comes from. The bankers started it all. The merchants who were not bankers, it, apart from the Italians who, as far as we can work out, probably did all use double entry, the non-Italians did not use it. There's only a few Germans that we know for sure were using double entry in the late 15th century, uh, so in about 1470, 1480. Um, there were Italian merchants in Spain in um, Mallorca, for example, in Valencia. And they would have been using it there, and they had some Spanish partners who must have been using double entry, and that's it. There was no English people using it, no Scottish people, no, no French people, no Germans. And if you think about the fairs that were going on, take, go back a century to the Champagne fairs in the 13, 1310. The only people using double entry were the Italians. The others didn't need to because all the clearing that took place went through the banks and the banks were all Italian. And it was the same in Venice in the 15th century. It was the same in Lyon in the 15th century. It was the same in Antwerp. No one else used double entry for their day-to-day -day business. The so non-bankers just were not using it. And they didn't use it because they didn't need to because the bankers did all the clearing. And they didn't have the same risks as the bankers in terms of debt. The bankers had lots of customers. The merchants did not. So the merchants, if you look at a set of merchants' books, you'll see a lot of bad debts. You'll see a lot of um, dubious debts, they called them, doubtful debts. And you'll see examples of debts that go back 35 years. They wouldn't take them out of the ledgers because in the ledger, they were legal evidence. Out of the ledger, if you write them off, they're no longer the legal evidence because you've effectively said you don't want the money anymore. That's why they didn't write off bad debts very much. But anyway, the non-Italians didn't use double entry until they felt they had to. And in the Leon affairs, they developed a system of clearing that required that everyone who was involved to use double entry. They had to. Otherwise, the clearing system would not have worked. And because that system, we know, was based on the one in Champagne, it's almost certain that in Champagne the same thing was happening. So the French merchants, the German merchants, the Dutch merchants, the Flemish merchants, the English merchants at Champagne who were involved in that whole business and had to be to get their debts settled in clearing had to have used the same system of bookkeeping as all the others. 
And so you might say, well, if they were doing it in the, in the Champagne Fair, why were they not doing it in their day-to-day -day books? Well, the answer to that is quite simple, because they did not need to. They didn't need that level of sophistication. It's much more sophisticated and complex to do a double entry record than it is to do a simple record, like Fred owes me 10 euros. That takes you, what, two seconds, three seconds to write at most. A double entry record, you need to make sure you know where the other side of the entry is. You need to make entries in the ledgers for both the debit and the credit. So they stayed away from it. They didn't want to do it. And then after uh, Leon and Antwerp closed because the Spanish invaded Antwerp, which sent all the merchants fleeing, and Leon just died a death, Amsterdam took over, and it carried on the same system as had been in place effectively in Lyon. So everyone involved in the Amsterdam markets had to use the same systems, otherwise they couldn't take part in clearing, and it spread across Europe. So that's, a, that's a basically the message of articles 4, 5 and 6 in 10 minutes or 15 minutes. How long was that? I don't know. Anyway, that's what those articles were about. Now, when you wrote your summaries, those of you that did and those that you haven't that are thinking about it now, um, you might have, I'm not going to ask for them this week, but anyone who wants to hand me one at the end, who wants to, I'm happy to look at it and give, send them feedback as I did to the three you did last week. Um, now, this is what I did. I did the, it said, I said in the recommended thing that you should do 200 words for the summary. And when, I'm, when I use the word summary about this, I'm talking about all seven points. I'm not talking about just this one section. So if I say, what, you need, what you should be doing each week is trying to do at least one of the articles in detail so that you help yourself remember it. And the other ones you do section seven, which is where you develop your critical thinking. So this one, the summary, it's recommended 200 words, and I wrote quite a lot. So I wrote 481 words. It's like I said last week, it doesn't matter how much you write. What's important is you put down what you think you need to put down. And I, I took, what I did was I hadn't read this article for about a year, maybe longer. So I sat down yesterday and I just started reading it and taking notes. And in 20 minutes, that's what, this is what I did. And I didn't rely on anything else. I didn't use any other sources while I was doing it. So if you, and I'll put this up online over the weekend. This stuff here is in the sequence that appears in the article. And, you know, every bit, I just put it down enough so that if I read this, I know what the article's all about. The article was written in, published in 73. That was before we started having abstracts. So you don't get much help there because there isn't one. I just want to point out one of the two things. And I, I point them out in here. And I know you can't, it's, the writing's not big enough for this. Let me try and blow it up. Whoops. Is that better? Right. So you see, I start off with um, what he's done at the very beginning. And he says that these fragments were firstly annotated by Santini then a couple of other people. Now, when the others did it, they changed it slightly, as I'll just point out. When I get to it, it's um, this article, and then I said what the nature of the article was here, just to keep me right, so that I would know if I ever thought about it, that there was something else out there I could go and read. So this is a different version. This is written for accountants, whereas the original article is written for medieval scholars. And they're quite, quite different, but there's a lot of the same material in it, except the other one has every art, every ed Every account has been translated into English. Um, then it goes on about how he describes things. So the articles are a description of everything that was going on in, as evidenced by the fragments. So what did they do in the fragments? How did they do it? What was it written on? Um, how did they separate each, each item in an account? By using the word item. Um, they used Roman numerals. They didn't use the, um, I always get this the wrong way around, the Hindu numerals that we use. It might be Arabic. Anyway, whatever one it is. And then it, 
I put in his description of how account was closed. And the fact that he points out the two sheets of parchment are not consecutive. And last, I think it was last week, or on a video, I, I made the point that because they're not consecutive, and because the references at the end of some of the entries indicate something's been entered three or four parchments later, these must all have been at one point bound together in a book. There must be many sheets bound together in a book. Um, just carries on with description. And now here, this is the point that I think is uh, the key one. He talks about the judicial disputes, the ledger being um, evidential. And this was, that was, uh, let's see, that was written by Santini, who's, uh, I forget what the word is, but he's a specialist in language. So he's not a lawyer. But his view was that would not have developed unless the legal system was supporting it. So the use of the spoken language was um, cru crucial to identify when double entry st started to be invented. Because by 1211, it had to have been in use for several decades to got to the point where the jurists were accepting it. And you get that from one, two or three sentences in the middle of this article. It's also a complete lift. If you look at this, go back to the original, you'll find all he's done here is he's pinched what was said by Santini. He's basically repeated it. So where he says, um, where Lee suggests that this method of bookkeeping is sufficiently sophisticated to blah, blah, blah. If Santini said that, but Lee decided to take the credit himself. So he doesn't actually credit Santini with it, which is an interesting point, um, I thought. And then down here, he says he's favored Shafini's expansion, and that's of all this, of the abbreviations in the text. There are a lot of abbreviations, and you'll see, see examples of that today if I've got a minute, and uh, next week for sure. So they just expanded the words differently, and if you see some of the expansions that Lee describes, if you look at them, he's taking two letters and turning that into a word that's eight characters long. Um, so what guarantees he got that that's right, or that another version is wrong, it's right. And then I go on and on and on and on and on, all right? So that's a full summary. And then the purpose, the article describes, whoops, early records of Italian bookkeeping. So he's just trying to describe it, it's descriptive. And again, I see descriptive about design, but he uses some critical analysis and you can see the critical analysis in some of the comments he makes about things he's described. And it'd be very good if you sort of, I picked any of them up in your own head because that's an illustrative of how to do critical writing. Um, he finds it's quite sophisticated bookkeeping and this is repeating the point made by Santini that's also in my summary. The sources used are all secondary and as he's read in the chapter that's something that you try and avoid. The chapter if you read through it makes the point. If you're using secondary sources like transcripts you cannot be sure that they're absolutely correct, so it's always better to get originals. But we can't get originals for this because they're no longer readable. So we have this, and that's all we can do with it. Um, the one thing that I pointed out about a... I oh, forget about this secrecy evidence, all right there. This bit about unsupported assertions, I just pointed out the mention of sophistication, which he pinched from Santini that I've already mentioned twice because that's a very clear example of a lack of a citation, but you can, you, can, you can understand it if you look, Santini's just in the sentence before it, and that's 10 minutes to go, which is really five minutes to go, so it won't be long. So that's basically what I did, and I said for the answer to the last bit, did the article add to the existing literature? I just said yes. Now I know that, but you, too, you all know that too, because he tells you. He's saying he's presenting it to an, an accounting audience at the beginning and it hasn't been presented to an accounting audience before, so it was original. Um, so you could have guessed yes, even if you didn't know it. Um, and that is basically what I did. Now you could all have written a lot more, a lot less, I don't know, but if you look, I've got one word, um, and then almost illegible for yourself, 43, 25, 92, 21, 43, 35, 19. So you don't have to write a lot. Just enough to give your mind a chance to work and think. And the point I made earlier, this section, section seven, this is where you develop critical thinking. 
You do that for every article, and by the end of this course, you'll have, you'll have got the hang of it. That's the message there. Right, there's two things I want to show you. What I'm going to do is just show you two examples of handwriting. What we're looking at is handwriting from the end of the 15th century. On the right hand side, it's a journal. And you can see it's very sort of spidery. And you'll get, hard, you'll get a, a copy of this over the weekend. We will stop now. I'll put the examples onto my Aberdeen and have a look at it before next week. You don't have to try and read it. Just have a look at it to get an, an, a sense of how difficult it is to read the material that these historians have used. And this is the easy part because this is the 15th century. Back in the 12th century and the 13th, the writing was much, much worse. I'll just say a couple of words about something else that you all need to hear about. Right, the course on uh, next Friday, you're getting the first of your tests. And I had a look this morning, and, or there was a, a couple of days ago, and there were only about five of you had tried the practice test. The practice test is, will reinforce your knowledge of week one. The real tests, the software is exactly the same. So if you haven't, if you haven't tried the practice test yet, if you haven't tried it, you need to try it and try it well before Friday of next week. Then when you get into the real test, you're going to get uh, 20 minutes to answer 11 questions. And some of those questions are, well, they're the same type of questions as the one you can see in the practice test. So you're going to have to put some words in, write them in. In case you're worrying about spelling, we are just about got that 100% OK. So we know what you put in, and the computer can, can trap 99% of that and say it's right or it's wrong. The 1% that's left will be picked up by me going through, the because it's only 25, 26 years, just going scanning through what you put in to see if anyone's managed to say something that should have been right but wasn't marked right. Now, when it finishes, the... Um, the score you get will be in the grade book. Just ignore it. Um, and at the end of the course, I take your four best scores and put them together, divide by two, and that's your assessment score. If you get a bad score next week, don't be put off. It's probably partly because you're not used to actually doing, having that type of assessment. And I don't mean the software, I just mean having that type of assessment. Because it's different from the ones you've been getting in the My Aberdeen, which are mainly MCQs. This is not that. You will get some MCQs. You might get a question that has eight or nine different options, and you have to pick one or two of them. But you'll always be told how many to pick. So it's not a random pick how many you think it should be. You'll be told specific numbers. If you get asked to put a number or do a calculation, make sure you follow the instructions. And it would be very sensible to have a calculator and a pen beside you uh, so that you can do the calculations that you might be asked. And because the questions will be taken from a pool of questions, there's about 20 questions and you're getting 11 of them, it's, you might never see a calculation question. On the other hand, you might see two or three. It just depends what, what happens, what comes out. But by and large, you should end up over the course of the 10 weeks, of the eight weeks, getting roughly the same amount each of calculations and fill in blanks and multiple choice and, and whatever. Anyone that's got any questions about what they've studied, any concerns about the test uh, during the week, just email me and I'll do my best to answer. If anyone gives me a question I think everyone needs to know the answer to, I'll put it up like I did with two questions this week. And that way everything should be okay. If you find your computer falls over, follow what I told you about that. Get out of it, get back into it, it doesn't work, email me straight away. And you have to contact me during the window, otherwise I can't do anything. And you just get whatever score it's showing on the system, and it's zero, I'm afraid it'll be zero. But you've got quite a big window, from 7am to 11am. And at 11.01, the whole test is available to you. 
and if you work through it, you'll see, and just redo the, the questions, you'll get the right answers given to you, and you'll also get all the questions you didn't see. The mock one that you get every week is the, it's the open version of the test you just had. So it's the same questions, except there's no limit in number of times you can do it. And at the end of doing that one, it's the same as the, the, the mock one, the formative one that was there this week. You get all of the questions you've answered and you're told what the right answers were for each of them. You don't get told any answers for questions you don't try. So if you want to know an answer, you've got to put one in. So you don't know, don't just guess. Because um, I've, seen, I've seen students last year, for example, just not answering any questions and looking for the answers and getting none. You know, so just do it. Well, thank you for your patience. Have a good weekend. And as I say, be in touch if you need to.